glitch. Um, so as you said, I'm Pete Leiden. I'm the founder of the media company reInvent. I'm the host for the kind of What's Now series here. Um, it's been four years since we started this in San Francisco in partnership, deep partnership with Capgemini. Capgemini has been with us and conceptualized this from the beginning. It's been a fantastic partnership. We've done um, four years of this every month in San Francisco. We've now expanded to spend two years here in, in New York. In fact, it's literally two years ago this month we had Steven Johnson who kicked off the series here in New York. For some of you who old timers that might have remembered that one, which was an awesome one. Um, so we've had up to 45 of these now. And the whole idea of this series has been to take really interesting technologists, really interesting entrepreneurs, really interesting thought leaders, and get them to tell us what is happening right now in their space. Not a polished talk, not what's kind of, you know, something like they've been doing to, in other kind of larger forms, but to kind of say, hey, what's, what are they thinking about now? What are they, what's going on in their head right now? And also to be thinking about how can we do things better in the future? It's been a kind of future-oriented kind of focus here. And that's what we're going to basically do uh, tonight. Now, it's been the last two years that we've actually had the expanded series here has also kind of coincided with the tech clash. It's been a kind of a sense of reckoning building for technology, big tech and technology companies. And um, this is really kind of one of the pieces we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about the potential of a market reckoning. The title of the, you know, the, what we got here is How Today's T Tech Unicorns May Be the New Dot Coms Heading for a Crash. For those of you who are as old as me, uh, uh, you remember those days well and bear scars from the great crash of 20 years ago. For anyone probably under 45, you're probably Wilson past the graveyard one more time and thinking, who knows what's going to happen here. But um, Scott's got some in interesting, really fascinating insight to this. And so some of you are coming here for the topic. Some of you are coming here for Scott Galloway. I'm going to introduce him in a second here. Um, but we're going to be talking again about what are the strong parallels going on in the market with the unicorns today and the valuations and what happened in the run-up of the 99 that actually ended up in the big crash of 2000. And it's really a serious look at are we heading into some kind of correction, market correction in that case. But here's where it gets even more interesting. We're actually, there's another reckoning that's going on with big tech, which is through essentially people through their governments are now starting to push back and get really upset about some of the excesses, some of the, let's just call them unintended consequences, uh, we could call them but also maybe some intended consequences. But um, we're really watching in our politics now, both parties starting to talk about breaking up big tech and do all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and really, though, the people who really get tech also don't really have a clear idea. Who get tech and understand the problems, it's not clear what we should do. And so part of what we're going to be doing here with, with Scott is talking a little bit about that kind of space, uh, and, and what could we, what should we be doing right now to big tech before this gets out of control and something happens that is not good for tech, but also is not good for everybody. Now, Scott is an excellent guide to this. Scott has, um, he's a professor of marketing here at nearby NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, he is a three-time, you know, serial entrepreneur with three companies that are very successful, Red Envelope, uh, what was the uh, profit, profit brand manager, sorry about that, uh, and also L2, which was uh, also bought by uh, Gartner. So he's had many successes. He understands tech from an early age, was in the whole scene out in the Silicon Valley in the um, 90s. Uh, he's also written a book that is a very important book, The Four, the hidden, D the DNA, the hidden DNA of the big four, Apple, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Google. And he did that in 2017, before it was cool to be talking about that. He's got some really interesting thoughts there. He's a very entertaining and also insightful folk uh, person who we're going to be running this through. But I will say two other things I just want to say here. Scott has attracted, and we've kind of in our network brought together some really interesting characters too. We're happy to have Stephen Levy here, who's kind of editor at large for Wired, who is coming out with a huge, well, at long anticipated book on Facebook, the inside look at Facebook, a lot of access Zucky can't really talk about it because it's coming out in February much, but he has a lot of insight in a long time in the tech world. And we have John Battelle, who did another event with us. Some of you remember in the beginning of the year, knows a lot about data, wrote, a, wrote the book, really one of the best books on Google. He'll be joining us shortly here. He's running a little bit late. So, oh, there is John right there. I was just introducing John. John, we got a seat safe you here. So anyhow, we've got a great group here. We've got a great crew together to talk. Let's uh, welcome Scott. Uh, give him a what's now... Welcome. Let's come in here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for 
I'd like to thank my dozens and dozens of fans for turning <laughs> out on me. <laughs> All right, let's, let's light this candle. Uh, so Scott, it was interesting. I, to give me a little background here, uh, I just recently got to know Scott. I was, um, I've been writing a story for Wired Magazine about the next 30 years, a positive but plausible scenario of what could happen right. How can we get a lot of things right, including what could we do with tech right? And I interview him and 25 other folks, including John Battelle, uh, who's here, 25 other folks, to really think hard about what, w if we did this right, what could we do? And as I talked to him about that stuff, we got smarter and smarter. I got, wow, it was such a great interview. And then he kind of went on a diversion, and he said, you know, but what really is interesting right now is the parallel to the dot-com crash of 99. And, uh, and you really, that was the thing that really was on your mind. And there's even been some breaking news today a little bit that's feeding into it. So, so why don't you, let's start with that. Let's talk yep. about the, the market re re correction potential here. And then we get to the governmental potential um, reckoning that's coming. So t talk a little bit about what's your, what's your insight there? What do you see happening here in the market? So there are a lot of things that are similar and probably just as many or more things that are dissimilar. And it's always easy to want to harken back and say, well, it's 1999 again. It's not, but there, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. So where does it rhyme? Um, if it, anyone's an entrepreneur and raising money right now, you're not nearly as cool as you think you are. And I speak <laughs> from experience. In 1999, I owned 30% of a company that was going to go public at a market cap of $2 billion, according to Credit Suisse First Boston that was taking us public. Me and a bunch of other guys were being flown to airfields around the West Coast to look at jets, and Bombardier was willing to take stock in exchange for these jets. Um, and I was offered, profit was doing, I always talk about numbers, and I know that's crass, but I find that people who don't talk about numbers are already rich and want to use the, asym the asymmetry of information such that you're happy making a good living when they're making fucking billions of dollars. So I talk about money in real terms. Uh, profit was doing three million a year, and I was offered 55 million by a company called Scient. Does anyone they, remember that? I do remember. And I said, no, we're going to the moon. I turned down 18 times revenues for a consulting firm that was doing $3 million a year. So there was a certain consensual hallucination that I engaged in uh, between myself and the markets and my ego and this, this kind of bubble and this flywheel or this upward spiral of hallucin uh, hallucination and kind of ego. And I found some similarities. If you could code and had a degree from a top 50 university and were 23, you were worth $150,000. And I find that's true again today. The mediocre people are exceptionally expensive. Uh, so I see that. Commercial real estate was out of control expensive. Uh, I see that again, although it looks like co-sharing co starts out some inefficiencies and is subsidizing the whole commercial real estate market. There was uh, companies that made no sense getting extraordinary valuations. So does anyone remember Cybershop? Cybershop was buying Furbies for $30 and selling them for $19.99, which was e-commerce revenue. And because they were going to do about half a million dollars in e-commerce revenue, they managed to get public at a market capitalization of $800 million. <laughs> so this is, and then talk about Pets.com, then talk about Internet Capital Group. Does anyone remember that? It was going to start a series of platforms for a B2B marketplace, and at one point it was worth more than General Electric. And there was, it, as far as I can tell, there was nothing there. It literally just kind of evaporated. So you see some of the consensual hallucination. You see the massive gross idolatry of uh, innovators. Uh, if you tell a 30-something-year-old 30 30 -year male that he's Jesus Christ, he's inclined to believe you. And I find that there's a lot of people like me now who believe they're Jesus Christ and think that they can create a cult and start using terms like saying to analysts when they get questioned about their business model, we can't be valued financially, we have to be valued culturally and spiritually. That's what Adam Newman said just four months ago to analysts who were questioning the numbers of WeWork as he wanted a valuation greater than Ford Motor. So it kind of feels the same. And, I, and by the way, I say this with some self-awareness now that I didn't have 20 years ago. I got totally caught up in it and thought that, oh yeah, it makes sense that my company, Red Envelope, which is basically a catalog company that we took online, was worth more than Williams-Sonoma because we had figured out a way to sell these products online. And there was a reckoning. Now, what's different is the reckoning is different. 
Amazon got taken down 70%. Cisco had one of the greatest market capitalization destructions. And it sort of set a torch, it created a spark that torched the entire market. And nobody was able to discern good from bad. It fundamentally messed with our, what we thought was this truism of technology was going to change everything. We were investing in sites. And the fact that this new economic model did not bear out created a level of, of insecurity and panic in the markets that literally the contagion went everywhere. And great companies almost went out of business. There was, there was some, a lot of smart analysts saying that Amazon was going to go bankrupt, that they'd made a mistake by taking debt because Bezos didn't want the dilution, and that they were going to go under. This time is different. Now let's talk about why this time yeah, is different. Uh, the markets are actually, this is a, what's going on here is a testament to how robust the markets are. And as much as I hate to say it, it's a testament to the Securities and Exchange Commission, and I'll talk about each. The market put up a firewall, mostly after uh, Uber. Uber is kind of the central player here, and that is Uber. There's unicorns that are companies that are overvalued. I think most of them are overvalued, but a lot of them have real value, real revenues, real business models, very strong management teams. But they're just overvalued. Zoom and Slack are great companies, massively overvalued. They're trading at 30 to 45 times revenues. Beyond Meat is a super neat idea, ridiculous that it's worth more than the entire agri-food business, even with a 66% decline in their stock over the last two months, still wildly overvalued. But the thing that got through the fire door that, that, that started the reckoning, if you will, and burned everybody was Uber. Because while there's unicorns that are generally speaking overvalued, but that's not the worst thing in the world, they're good companies, and at some point, three, five, ten years, a small non-zero proportion of them will end up being the next Amazon or, or show incredible returns. There's other companies that through a combination of the idolatry of innovators and excess, massive excess of capital looking for a home, this kind of yoga babble that the media has bought into, where the bigger the vision, the bigger the charisma, that must mean the bigger the, bigger the opportunity, has resulted in a series of companies with this gross idolatry of innovators, charismatic CEO, and a plethora of cash are what I would term incinerators. And that is they are literally incinerating, not creating any value, but there is no difference in them taking Uber, literally taking $100 million a week and incinerating it. No remnant value, no learning, other than the fact that technology's core competence has become the exploitation of workers. That's the big learning from Uber. We can figure out a way to rob 5 million driver partners. By the way, partner is Latin for no minimum wage protection or access to health insurance or bathroom breaks. So it's that we can figure out a way for them to create a payday loan against the deferred maintenance in their cars because of this Hunger Games-like economy. If they have a smartphone, we'll convince them to work for less than minimum wage. And despite that, we are burning $100 million a week. And when you look at what's happening around the nation, when we've kind of come to the realization that these people deserve some dignity, and AB5 and legislation is going to take the prices up, this company makes absolutely no sense and is incinerating billions of dollars. That got through the fire door. The markets are realizing it. Retail investors, your mom, my dad, firemen, policemen, teachers who are all invested in the market indirectly through their 401ks or through pension funds, got their hands burned. The stock is down, I think, about 40% since the IPO. It will never reach these levels again. It's off another 50% in the next 6 to 12 months. We got burned. So we're like, enough of that. We're closing the firewall. We're closing the fire door on other incinerators. Oh my gosh, here comes the mother of all incinerators, we. And there was this, and by the way, I'm not piling on. Everyone accused me of piling on. In 1997, and I'm on CNBC saying this in Business Insider, I said we was the most, value, the most overvalued private company in the world. And two weeks after I said that, SoftBank stepped in and and did another round at double the previous valuation. And everyone said, you're wrong, you're an idiot. Those who can't teach do, you know, the, the same criticisms I get all the time. And I said, this is still the most overvalued private company. This makes no sense and when was that? at you, all. What? February of 1997. Publicly stated, most overvalued private company in the world. Wait, this 1997? Was I'm sorry, 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. am I? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> well, that's, you said that the first time, and I was like, 97? Wow, I was like, that's pressing. I am, I am from the past. <laughs> This is, a, this is H.G. Wells meets the planet of the apes. Uh, anyways, okay. what is time anyways? Time is curved. <laughs> no, stick to the story. We just so <laughs> we had we. And the SEC mandates something called an S-1 or a prospectus. And I was in Nantucket, 
And I remember the weekend, August 17th I was, and I literally said to the people I was with, I read the first three pages and I'm like, I'm out for the weekend. This is what I'm doing all weekend. I had never seen anything like this. Whether it was a corporate structure that looked like a Chinese firm, made a Chinese firm look American pre-internet. The corporate governance here, which is so ridiculous, it basically said, it included that if the CEO who had controlling shares, which is a very dangerous thing, dies, that the management, the board didn't get to pick the, the next CEO, his wife did. And if him and his wife went down in the same plane or bus together, their descendants got to pick the CEO. <laughs> you had a guy who had sold the we name back to the company who, where he was the majority shareholder in for $6 million because he trademarked it for his private family office while he was CEO of the company he was the largest shareholder in. He was selling shares in the private market, $700 million, previous to the roadshow trying to convince you to buy shares, even though he had, he had sold the equivalent of the National Endowment of the Arts, the Peace Corps, and I don't know, throw in the Secretary of the Interior's budget. He would sold that much in private, private market, but you should buy shares. And then he was taking that money to buy real estate that he was then leasing back to the company at above market rates. What a shocker today. The New York District Attorney has announced action has announced an investigation against we, specifically against Adam Newman. And here's the thing. I don't think Adam Newman probably did anything illegal other than seeing a glitch in the matrix and an ability to exploit our idolatry of innovators, the, the incredible surplus of cash. But there's a decent chance he might go to jail because the fastest blue line path for an attorney general to the governor's mansion right now is to go after a populist argument against one of these people. And you have 4,000 people who are staring at a guy whose vision they bought into is now on the Forbes 100 list for burning $18 billion. And they are now trying to figure out if they're going to have health insurance. And by the way, they're all voters. So the amount of anger that is about to be unleashed on this guy, and it's going to result in what I, you know, I think, look, the district attorney listens to people. This they're going to go after him. This is, by the way, I didn't know this happened today because I was all focused on this event, but this just happened today, so maybe half the people here don't even know this, but uh, you know, the DA just did launch this. He announced this action against WeWork and specifically Adam Newman. And what we have that's different this time is the autopsy on We will be seen as death by S1. The moment the S1 came out, a bunch of people, media, academics, reporters, did some great work. Shira Overday, Matt Levine, Elliot Brown at the Wall Street Journal, the previous two at Bloomberg, did some great work here and said, this thing makes no sense. And what, what was the tell? What was the tell that the emperor had no clothes? Is they said, we're going to go out at $47 billion. And by the way, Goldman and JP Morgan both had credible internet analysts propped up to justify that valuation, which to me is like, OK. You know, I've said this publicly. The CEO of Goldman Sachs is like the worst fucking DJ in the world, and he's the worst fiduciary. <laughs> I mean, the fact that these companies were going to prop up an internet analyst to try and convince us these companies were worth, Goldman was saying this company was worth 60 to 80 billion. And then when they, they went on the roadshow, and institutional investors that could do math said, no way. They came back and said, well, would you take 20 billion? <laughs> so what does it mean? What does it mean when the people who know the company are willing to take a 60% haircut in valuation and still go public? It means they know that they're carrying a sack of shit and they got to get out. <laughs> and the li thing, literally, that's when we knew it was over. And they got bailed out at a valuation of $8 billion. This thing isn't worth $8 billion. It's worth less than zero. And here's why. As an entrepreneur, I've started companies. And when you start them in bad times, it's hard not to imprint bad DNA. You spend too much money on office space. Mediocre people cost too much. And you justify hiring them. You start spending money on expensive snacks. You start mistaking your talent or excess capital for talent and you imprint a bad DNA on the company. This is in good times or bad times? In, in the best, best times. In the best times, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm literally, I've started nine companies, I'm three, four, and two. I think about this a lot, I'm very data-driven. The only correlation between my successes and failures is where in the economic cycle I started a company. This is absolutely the worst time to, sell, to start a company. When shit gets real in the next 12, 24, 36 months, and we go through another recession, which we always do and we'll survive it, just as we hit the depths of that recession, that's the time to start a business. That is absolutely, every time I started a company in a recession, boom, it worked. Every time I started a company in a boom time, did not, did not work. Anyways, the DNA imprinted on WeWork is terrible, and they're not going to be able to pull the nose up. You have employees making somewhere between 30 and 50% more than market. 
you have a cost structure that is not, you can't, you can fire people, but you can't reduce their salaries. It's almost impossible to reduce someone's salary. It's easier to fire them. And they're trying to do things like turn employees into contractors. This business makes absolutely no sense. The DNA is totally screwed. What Afghanistan and Vietnam were to Russia and to the US, we work as to SoftBank. <laughs> this thing, this thing is a bankruptcy by Q4 or some side of peace with honor. Q4 of 2020 or the middle of 2021. It gets worse from here, not better. Back to you, Peter. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I'm the optimist. Um, well, let's, so very convincing about we work. But what do you think about the broader market then? I mean, because, for example, like you said, last time around, really quality companies really went down. But on the other hand, do you, don't you think this would be a differentiated market in many ways? I mean, who's going to really... I mean, the four you're talking about, uh, they might have troubles, which we'll get to in a minute, on outside forces, but, um, but there's a lot of good value out there, too. So, so, so how do you see this playing out in terms of the, this time's correction, basically? Well, the market's been much more discerning this time, right? The market has said, Apple's up 54% in the last 12 months. Companies that people have discerned, within unicorns, they've discerned between consumer companies. So they said, all right, consumer companies masking as tech, we got fooled once, right? Right, okay, that's not, you're not a tech company. Having an app to reserve a conference room does not make you a tech company. Delivering happiness, you're not a SaaS company, you're selling exercise equipment, that's Peloton. All right, you, you sell plant-based meat, but you're not really a technology company. And by the way, and I've been wrong so far, I've been predicting Tesla's gonna get just absolutely taken to the woodshed. I don't think it's a software company, I don't think it's a tech company, I think it's an awesome car. And they bend steel like every other automobile company, and it's a low margin shitty business. The market seems to be discerning between consumer tech, which has gotten eaten alive in the, in the public markets, and true tech SaaS-like companies with amazing margins. You could, I think margin is an incredibly important concept for the consultants and the younger people here. Margin, technically speaking, a set of assets and then you add some value there, culture, process, IP, whatever it might be, artisanship, and whatever you sell for, those are your margins. You could go through any of these companies and look at their margins, their gross margins, and have a pretty good indication of how they've fared once they hit the public markets. So SaaS companies, true tech SaaS companies with 70, 80, 90 points of gross margin, they've actually done really well. Peloton, 45%, is at exactly its IPO price, it's held. And then Uber, and we, 20 and 30 points of gross margins, which it's hard to imagine they ever get to a point of scale where they can have operating margins, they've been killed. So where is Uber right now? Uber is in the green mile. They're being walked to the electric chair, and they know it. So what are they doing? They're trying to find another business, a SPAC. A SPAC is a special purpose acquisition core, where a smart group of people go raise 50 to $500 million and say, we're smart, we're gonna go buy a company, it becomes the public company, and we're gonna build a lot of value. Uber is now the largest SPAC in the world. They have a ridiculously shitty business called ride hailing that will never make any money and have to, have to, have to um, shrink. So they're constantly trying to find an Amazon Media Group or an AWS through an incredible brand. Uber's an amazing brand. It's a global brand that is the first and last brand the globally affluent see. They have a lot of capital still. They have a smart management team. So they have to go find another business to grow into something resembling this valuation. Uber Freight, not so far. Uber Copter, come on, that's stupid. Uber Eats, that business is getting eaten alive by overcapitalization. I look at DoorDash, there's just too much money chasing too few deliveries of Chipotle, right? So it's, it's taken all the margin out of it. So you're gonna see, and then they announced Uber Money. Is it called Uber Money? A payment system? They are desperately in a room saying, Uber, fill in the blank here. We have maybe 18, maybe 24 months to find a growth story around a business with something resembling margins. Otherwise, we're done. They're going to have to withdraw from a bunch of markets, go from a growth story to a margin story. Uber's a fantastic company. It's a fantastic service. It should be worth 5 to $10 billion. It's down another 50 to 70% in the next 12 to 24 months. How about other unicorns, though, that make more sense? I see a senior person here from Airbnb, and I've done quite a bit of work with them, actually. There are unicorns that make sense, don't you think, yeah. that actually are making money, could make money, actually have a good play? I mean, so, so kind of distinguish between that, your, your kind so of... So you talked about Airbnb, and this is going to sound like a setup. I didn't know you're here. I don't know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> you look so sheepish and scared right now. <laughs> 
Okay. So Airbnb, let's look at Uber. Uber has to have local demand. To build a ride-hailing company, you have to have a local demand. But you don't need global, or you have to have local supply of people who will drive cars. You have to have enough money, 10, 20, 50 million bucks, to convince enough drivers to create liquidity of supply in that local market. But you also just need local demand. You have to create demand among people who want to take cars in the Houston market. Where Airbnb, and I said two years ago, Airbnb would be more valuable than Uber when Airbnb was at 50, and I'm sorry, Airbnb was at 10 and Uber was 50, the valuations will be flipped. Airbnb will much be, be much more valuable than, Air, than uh, Uber, probably already is. Why? Because with Airbnb, you need local supply of apartments but what you also need is global demand, because the majority of people coming into New York City this weekend are from all over the world. And to replicate that, you and I could start a ride-hailing company in East Village or in Manhattan for 30 or $50 million. We'd lose it all, but we could start it for 30 to $50 million. <laughs> to start an Airbnb competitor right now would take billions, because you have to create global demand. You'd have to create a brand that when someone from Copenhagen is coming to Seoul, they know to look on the Airbnb platform. In addition, let's talk about margins. Anyone who's been on Airbnb and pays their usurious fees knows there's margin in there. <laughs> you think, oh, that's a great deal. A loft in the East Village for 280 bucks, 560 bucks. You're like, wait, no, wait, it's 690? Why is that? And then you see this 90, 110, $130 fee. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that when the S1 comes out, their margins are going to be not 20%, not 40%. I bet their margins are going to be somewhere between 40 and 55%. So that company goes public and is worth more than Uber. Airbnb, and this is very fortunate because I always sound like this depressed, angry guy. <laughs> Airbnb, <laughs> Airbnb is a winner. Now, whether I don't know what the last, last private market valuation is, but, but Airbnb is an interesting example of a high-margin company with much bigger moats uh, than Uber. Also, the CEO there, I don't know if it's genuine or not, appears to be taking responsibility for problems. This is unacceptable. This is what we're doing to fix it. Instead of, we need to do better. We need to do better. Trust is the most important thing. <laughs> Trust is the most important thing. I mean, this literally delay and obfuscation sociopathic communication strategy. Did you see what Dara Khosra Shahi said last week? What yeah. do you think of the public? You have a guy on your board who represents the Public Investment Fund in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia who has been proven that they orchestrated the death of a U.S. journalist. And what was his answers? Well, everyone makes mistakes. <laughs> we made a mistake. People deserve to be forgiven. A mistake. Leaving the garage door open and the state-sponsored murder of a U.S. journalist. He's conflating the two. So not only, and by the way, I think Dara Khosrowshahi is the new lipstick on cancer. We have the $2 billion beard lipstick on cancer. That sounds sexist, it is, called Sheryl Sandberg, who basically trashed her reputation in exchange for $2 billion, running around telling people and women to have this important dialogue around gender, while her platform is weaponized under her watch by the foreign intelligence arm of the Russian government to suppress the vote in swing districts such that we could have an illegitimate president who appoints people to the Supreme Court who are inch by inch eroding a woman's right to choose. Sheryl Sandberg is the worst thing that has happened to women in the last 50 years. Lean in. Uh, I got off track. <laughs> we might have to get Stephen into this conversation. I'm in, I'm in here, not right now. Um, Anyone here from Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, okay. uh, back to Brian. Uh, He's at least taking responsibility yeah. and at least seems genuine about addressing these problems as opposed to the 770 person PR department and communications department at Facebook that is there to do nothing but deploy delay and obfuscation around a company that is depressing our teens. You want to talk about species failure? Self-harm among girls, I'm, I'm really ranting now. <laughs> yeah. Self-harm, okay. Go for it. suicide among teens is up 58%. Self-harm among teen girls is up 128%. Why? And I know we're not supposed to, we're supposed to act like boys and girls and there's no difference and it's all a spectrum. Boys are different than girls. Boys bully physically and verbally. 
girls bully relationally, and we have put nuclear weapons in their hands, and literally young girls are killing themselves. And when you think about, it sounds politically correct to say girls are the future. Well, they are. 70% of high school valedictorians are now girls. Look at what's happening at firms like this. They're now hiring more and more women, right? They literally are. It's not hard to make the statement that girls are the future, and we've decided to let a company Right? And I'm not saying they're the only ones. A lot of it is parents like myself who create this concierge and bulldozer parenting such that our kids never develop their own immunities. <laughs> but the fact that we can directly reverse engineer Instagram and shaming and, and body shaming and a lack of self-esteem and bullying to a company, and they're doing fuck all about it, that is species failure. How do we let this happen, Peter? <laughs> This seems like a good time to actually shift the conversation, but it, it, because, um, because it actually works. From, from the market, we're watching the market the, you know, play itself out, is to the more conscious politics of, okay, what are we actually going to do here? And I, I will say, um, let's talk about that. Because you and I, actually, that's how we started our talk. Um, you said, like, was this a good idea? No, 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 totally good idea. Was totally this good idea. A good idea. You get excited. No, 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 you're, you're awesome about it. But, um, but I, let's talk about this other reckoning. And we can do both, and in Q&A, we're going to bring it all back. You know, we can, we can talk about the market stuff, too. But, um, but this is where we make conscious, through politics, through government, we're making conscious choices about how do we want to shape these extremely powerful tech com you know, technologies in, you know, carried out by these incredibly powerful companies yep. led by these, you know, often charismatic and very powerful people. And um, it's only been recently, the last couple of years, that people who, even within tech, outside tech, whatever, has, has, we've been lionizing this field. We've been, I mean, I've been for 25 years from Early Wired watching this story and been, you know, could do no wrong and has grown into these amazing things. It's only been in recent, let's say, 10 years or so that they've gone into the global companies, commanding heights of the global economy, the power that they have. And I think now it's where everyone's going, whoa, what have, what's happened? Right. And how do we really do this? And so there's one way from the outside to just kind of hit a sledgehammer and you know, break them up and things like that, although I think that's part of it. But I'm saying from a more subtle kind of tech perspective, and this is where you're coming from, you get out of tech works, you come out of that world, you have enough distance from it to kind of not be beholden to it. There's other folks here that have kind of pointed out earlier in this introduction um, who also have that kind of perspective. And so let's talk about what do we do? Sure. I mean, what, what, what is, how do we start thinking about what you just laid out, the, the kind of tragedy of Facebook? I mean, there, there's a, we, we can kind of wave our hands about that and get all upset about it, but we got to start also thinking about what, what, what it really, what's happening here. And I will say one thing, I'm going to jump to the, that you would, when I had my conversation with you, mm -hmm. One of the big insights I got from him was you said, um, we need a checks and balances in, in, in a way that we, we've kind of lost the checks and balances in the bigger tech economy, but also the economy at large. And that there's, so from a bigger problem point of view, what do you see as the big problem here? And what do you see as kind of a bigger way to kind of think of the solution? And we can get into some specific ideas, including around sure. the four, and then I think we can get other people involved here a little bit. So how, when you think of the problem, what happened and what do we need to start figuring out? So uh, I th if you think about it uh, very um, pragmatically or in a sober fashion, they, the CEOs of these companies that I, I you know, try to shame by name or whatever, they're doing their jobs. We're not doing ours. Uh, a powerful part of the capitalist engine is for-profit companies, and their job is to return profits to their stakeholders. And they'll occasionally get together and say, well, it's not shareholders, it's stakeholders, but at the end of the day, you get hired and fired based on your ability to grow shareholder value primarily. And they're doing their job. They wake up every morning and figure out how do we sell more ads, more search terms, more iPhones, uh, uh, you know, some more cloud-based services. They're doing their job. Our job is to elect people that aren't a co-conspirator to private power, but are a countervailing force. Once AT&T got to 80% long distance, we elected people to win it and broke them up. And they made the same arguments back then. We need, we're national players. NTT's going to take over. You need a natural monopoly to make the CapEx investment. And the FTC and the DOJ and a bunch of senators said, no, 
Telco is so important, we're going to break you up and see what happens. And within 10 years, all seven companies were worth more than the original company. And we found out that things were stuck in Bell Labs, including cell, fiber, data, analytics. We have a proud history of antitrust. And unfortunately, because these companies, these technologies are so complicated, and 4% of our elected officials have a background in technology or engineering, this shit's really difficult and complicated to understand. They're also, their biggest line item in terms of increase in budget is not R&D, it's not even legal defense, it's lobbying. There are 88 full-time Amazon lobbyists in DC. Think about this, 81, 88 really talented people who are doing nothing but playing golf, having drinks, and presenting compelling information to lawmakers around how Amazon should not be broken up. And here you have, here you have, okay, let's talk about the, the government becoming a, a co-conspirator as opposed to counter value. Our new neighbor is Jeff Bezos. He's our new you, neighbor. You personally. Well, he's, he's just bought, he's just spent $90 million on a co-op, right? And hmm. what happened? Let's think about Jeff Bezos and the government in New York, because I think it's fascinating. And by the way, I'm taking another victory lap. I predicted two years ago that it would be one of two places, HQ2, either New York or DC, and I was wrong, it was both. And my sophisticated analysis was he owns three homes, one in Seattle, one in Calorama, DC, and one on the Upper East Side. And if you're worth 55, if you're 55 and worth $160 billion, do you really think you're gonna roll in Indiana? <laughs> you're gonna think, I know, I'm the wealthiest man in the world, and the only thing I can't buy is more time on this planet, so I'm gonna spend 14 weeks a year in Columbus, Ohio? <laughs> think about it, there's no way, I'm like, he's moving, <laughs> He's about, to be, he's about to be the sexiest man alive, I, uh, someone who lives in New York with $150 billion. He's coming to New York. And then he said, D that's it. I'm pulling out of New York. That's it, remember? They're pulling out. And CNBC and all the other people that position themselves are capitalists, but they're actually the worst type of socialists. They're cronious. Said, these people don't get it. AOC doesn't get it. They're socialists. They don't, think, they don't get it. Well, OK, you know what's happened? at Amazon and AWS since they pulled out and left New York, they are hiring more people. They've hired 1,100 people since they pulled out for Amazon New York. They've hired another 500 people in New York since they pulled out. They're on pace to hire more than the 25,000 people uh, jobs they guaranteed over 10 years. They're on pace to do more. And by the way, we don't have to give them the $3 billion. Governor Cuomo, Governor, Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio are literally the worst poker players on the planet. <laughs> literally. And we didn't have to give $3 billion from our municipal fire, police, and school districts to fund a man's crazy midlife crises. Put your hand back in your fucking pocket, Bezos. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan had this whistle call called the welfare mother, or the welfare queen. Remember that? Yeah. And it was basically a caricature of a black woman on welfare drinking champagne. Wildly racist. The mother of all welfare queens is Jeff Bezos. He's worth $150 billion. He pays no taxes because he never sells his stock. He borrows against it from Jamie Dimon at 1.9% interest, never, ever creating a taxable event. And if you look at the 3 to $10 billion Amazon is going to get in public subsidies this year for putting their data center in Phoenix, he owns 17% of the company, so he's going to get somewhere between $500 million and $1.7 billion from us taxpayers. So Jeff Bezos isn't a taxpayer. He's a tax debtor. The mother of all welfare queens is the wealthiest man in the world. Alexa, is this a good thing? <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> what were we talking about? No, we're, on, we're on track here. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so uh, break him up. So, so, so let's just. So, so I'm, antitrust. No, no, no. So I'm. So, so I'm peak, No, I'm. I'm it's antitrust. all good. It's all rolling out. Break him up. No. So there, a lot of these are platforms, yeah. and there's a lot of tech folks here who get platforms. So breaking up platforms is kind of different than breaking up, you know, whatever, some manufacturing giant or something that's got three different kinds of widget makers or something. I mean, don't you think, now, what, what do you think about it when you think about that? I mean, is it just, or do you think it's relatively the same? Hey, we just take Facebook, Instagram, you know, boom, break them up. We take YouTube, Google, break them up. We take, you know, Amazon web services from Amazon, break them up. You feel that's the kind of, that would be fine and, and, wouldn't, and wouldn't have detrimental platform implications because they're all kind of separate platforms? Yeah, what well, you said. 
That's exactly but right. But would you then go beyond that to the platforms themselves to break up, to create more competition within any of those? Or, or, or I guess that's where you'd stop with the breaking up. Break up coherent entities that seem to be aggregated up into these monster companies. So if Instagram can be purchased, why can't it be spun? By the way, most valuable company in the world 2025 will be an independent AWS. There's no pure play way as an investor to play the cloud right now. The fastest growing, largest market share company in the sector that's growing faster and is the most profitable part of technology, the cloud. Amazon goes public or AWS gets spun. Every person in this room owns the stock. You're buying stock for your grandkids. You're like, oh, well, I'll just buy AWS. You won't even look at the valuation. AWS will be the most valuable company in the world by 2025. And then by 2030, Amazon will be the most valuable company in the world again based on the back of disruption of healthcare. Instagram is possibly going to be worth more than Facebook. Instagram, wow. well, I think Instagram is literally Condé Nast and um, uh, broadcast TV, and I'm trying to think of the best ways to reinvent um, branding. I think Instagram's just this juggernaut platform, and it hasn't been infected by the Russians yet. And it, is, it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem to be uh, um, something that's been weaponized yet, other than the fact it's bad, uh, bad for kids. But typically speaking, we have a long history of breakups. Everybody wins in a breakup. It's like one of the few government actions we get right all the time. Investors win. Look what's happened to PayPal since eBay was spun it, right? And there was all the things, well, eBay, the payment thing, how do we separate it? It's been wildly accretive for shareholders. The AT&T breakup, the aluminum breakup, the seven sisters of, of the oil companies, shareholders win. When they announced, the FTC and the DOJ announced about four months ago that they were going after these guys, their stocks lost the value of Boeing the next market, the next morning. And the investors got it wrong. These companies are worth more separate than they are together. The only person that loses, employees win because they have stock options, investors win, the markets win because there's more innovation. What do you, th what do you think ha the best way to stop the Russians from infiltrating Facebook is if you broke up Instagram and Facebook, I bet one of them will go, well, you know what, the guy running PNG is a veteran. Maybe we say to him as a means of differentiating from the other social platforms, we're going to make the requisite investments to ensure this isn't weaponized by a foreign government. Or someone says, we're going to be the good guys, and we're going to demand identity, and we're not going to let anyone under the age of 16 be on our platform. You know, everyone talks about this stuff as if it would be impossible. No, it's not. We're not talking about the realm of the possible. We're talking about the realm of the profitable. And there's no reason for Facebook to ever do anything. They're a monopoly. You might get angry and not be on Facebook, and then you go to I Instagram to complain about it. If, <laughs> if, if Google spun YouTube or was forced to spin YouTube, what happens in the first off-site strategy, strategy meeting of YouTube? What, do they, what business do they decide to get into so they can all own ho houses in the Hamptons? They get into search. And what does Google decide to do to continue growth? They get into video. And overnight, we have two viable players. Think about how crazy and dangerous it is that one company gets to be God 93% of the time. As societies become more educated, more affluent, their dependence on a super being goes down, but our questions get bigger, so we need someone to fill that void. That's Google. You trust Google more than any priest, rabbi, mentor, scholar, or boss. It knows what STDs you have. It knows if you're thinking about getting divorced. It knows which ones of you are planning to leave Capgemini in the next 30 or 60 or 90 days. Google knows <laughs> everything about you. And what's a prayer? A prayer is a query into the universe, hoping there's some sort of divine authority that sees everything, processes your prayer, and then sends back an answer that you can trust. <laughs> that perfectly describes Google. Google, somehow, we let one company be God 93% of the time. We don't understand the algorithms. When you type in how to overthrow my government is the first thing you see how to build a dirty bomb or a voter registration form. And one company gets to decide that. That is really uncomfortable. We need more than one company making those decisions. And slowly but surely, as a means of differentiating from each other, they'll raise their hand and go, you know what? We're just going to get rid of instructions on dirty bombs, just for the hell of it. We're just going to decide that's not cool. Right now, they have no reason to do anything that gets in the way of their supernova business model. So they will delay and obfuscate and use these terms and throw very attractive people in front of Congress and send them on book tours. These are some of the most likable people in the world. I purposely, I know I'm bragging, I don't meet with any of these people because I know I like them. <laughs> you they're will impossible. like them. Yeah, I will like them. They're impossible not to like. They come across as genuine and they want to know you. 
And I was, Scott, I love your work. I mean, we disagree, but we love your work. Would you like to do a dinner with X? I'm like, fuck that. I don't want to be co-opted by these people. <laughs> You'll like them. You'll absolutely like them. I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Well, then we'll shift to one. Sorry. Uh, it's a few the more mess. questions here, and then we're going to open it up to some other folks. But um, data. Do you have any strong feelings about how the lifeblood of this economy works? Do we need to fundamentally rethink who owns data, who has access to data, how we plug and play data between competitors? Uh, I know John's been thinking about this a little bit, but I'm curious, where, where do you fall in this world? How do you think about that? So if you look, the young people in this audience have voted with their actions, and that is you want your privacy violated as long as your utility or it can help you get to the airport faster. So privacy is a vastly overrated concern until recently. And then when we found out, wow, we didn't realize our, our data was being molested like that. There's ideas around giving you so sovereign ownership of your data. I don't see how you would implement that. Again, I see the answer as competition, and I also think we start fining and firing and putting people in jail when data leaks or gross negligence turns into really dangerous things for our society. So, for example, the CDC has really, really sensitive data on all of us. Really sensitive data. If you're diagnosed with a certain illness, the C they, it, the doctors have a mandatory disclosure to the CDC. They have very, but they haven't been hacked. They haven't been weaponized by the GRU. The CDC figured it out, but the geniuses at Google can't? No, they can. They just don't want to because the CDC is, I mean, the CIA hasn't been hacked to the same extent. They have incredibly sensitive information and a ton of data. So there are organizations that have figured this out. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's as much around data use and data privacy. I think it's about enforcement of laws. I think it's about holding people accountable. I think it's about competition such that people say, I will make your data portable. The, the act that just passed from Senator Mark Warner that makes data interoperable between platforms is a start. We need thoughtful regulation like that. But I do think the answer is competition and also holding these people accountable. I think if the Facebook executives were old 58-year-old guys with beer bellies, I think they'd be in a world of hurt right now. I think meaning, the, say more, meaning why? Well, Bomber and Gates, the DOJ and the FTC moved in on them in 99 because they were unattractive and unlikable. If you, look at where <laughs> the, if you look at the market share, think about Gates has become very likable. Think about Gates in 99 and see Bomber in 99. Yeah. They were the depth, they wouldn't play the game, they wouldn't go do PR, they wore bad clothes, they were open and honest about how they wanted to be the Darth fit. People hated those people in the community, they came across as unlikable totally unattractive, and the DOJ and the FTC moved in on them when they had less market share than Facebook or Google because they were unlikable. And the problem is these companies have learned from the sins of the father and have purposefully managed these incredible likability campaigns, and the FTC and the DOJ have, for some reason, stayed around with them, away from them because they've wrapped themselves in a bright pink, blue, or rainbow bl blanket, right? By the way, I'm a progressive. Progressive blanket is the best cloud cover in the world if you're Darth Vader and Ayn Rand during the day, right? <laughs> First openly gay CEO of a Fortune 500 company, how can you not like Tim Cook? And he's putting Spotify, a superior business, out of business, right? Like inspiring young immigrants from, from Russia, met a PhD pro, how can you not like those guys? Those guys are the cutest people ever. How can you not love a woman who talks openly and eloquently about personal loss? If she had written a book on the rights of the unborn, do you think the board would be asking her to do book tours? Conservatives are seen as smart but mean. We liberals are seen as nice but weak. What is a better cloud cover or blanket or sheep's clothing for a tech CEO than to come across as wildly liberal and progressive? And they may be. I don't know what's in their hearts. But if they were Republican and talking about gun rights, their boards would say, keep it to yourself. It's the perfect cover of their progressive values. Okay, last question before Sorry. we're going to open it up here. Because this is something, and there's people here who might have insights in this. It gets to the tech world. I mean, I've been part of it for 25 years. You have too. Um, is there an opening here, despite what you've said, because uh, is there an opening that tech, it's a young industry, relatively heady industry, just happened overnight, this power. Um, a lot of the people who work in the industry, their employees are want to do the right thing. They don't want to be part of a company that's the kind of dark side of everything. Do you think there's an opportunity here 
for the tech world to really play ball with not just federal government, the governments, European governments, state governments, and really start to rethink what what they do and and, and take, you know, in terms of spreading taxes differently, moving wealth differently, open to regulations differently, you know, becoming more kind of utility, you know, they're almost like utilities. I mean, do you think there's in the next 10 or 12 years or 15 or whatever it is, a shift in the zeitgeist of the tech world in a way that you didn't see in Wall Street, you didn't see in the oil industry, older industries, battle-hardened, you know, decades and decades there. Do you think there's something different about tech and, or an opportunity here, or do you think I'm just dreaming? I think you're dreaming. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Look, we'll all make your instinct and your, your, first, your first obligation is to affix your own oxygen mask. Your obligation is to provide economic security and prosperity for your family, first and foremost. And that instinct takes over. Yeah, but a billion dollars or two well, billion or a hundred million or what? I mean, how much is too much? I mean, the, the, once you get to that point, I think you start believing I'm a good person. You surround yourself naturally with people who constantly reinforce what a, an amazing person you are. You start buying reputation with philanthropy. You start doing good things with that money, and you start believing your own rap. It's very, the person running Altria thinks he or she is a good person. They don't wake up and think I'm a bad person. The people at the NRA think they're good people. They will never make the link between the sale of assault weapons and the murder of children. They will never make that link. The people at cigarette companies never made the link between tobacco and cancer. And they weren't bad people. You will, all of us, I mean, a certain small minority of you are better people than me and will we'll we'll be willing to sacrifice your own economic well-being to do the right thing. The majority of people in a capitalist society, because... If you get rich, you have access to better health care, you have access to a broader selection set of mates, and your kids are going to prosper. Look who's going to the top, 60 of the top 100 schools, the industry I'm in, have more people from the top 1% of income earning households than the bottom 60%. So what's the best thing you can do for your kids? Be rich. And so if you want to do good things for your kids, you will make incremental decisions and believe that we want, we're trying to do the right thing. And oh wait, Facebook actually helps people see both sides. You will actually talk yourself into that. Hoping that they're calling on their better angels is a bad strategy. It hasn't worked in any other industry. That's why we give 23 cents on the dollar to these people called congressmen and senators. They're supposed to think long term. That's their job. Companies are supposed to think about profits. They're doing their job. We're not doing our job. We're not electing people that have shown the backbone to think long term around the regulation and the antitrust around these companies. So yeah, I'd like to think that Mark Zuckerberg will wake up and go, should one guy have control of the content going to the population of the Southern Hemisphere plus India? Maybe I could use, maybe it would be good to dissolve some of this power. Maybe it's time for me to become chairman and bring someone else and turn the page. I don't think he's going to do that. I just don't think he's going to get there on his own. So I believe we need to, to interject. And if you really look at your own, I know if I were in that position, I'm not sure I wouldn't be doing the same thing. That's your job in a capitalist society, is to be economically secure. So they're doing their job, we're not doing ours. I don't think, I don't think they're going to have a reckoning on their own. OK, we're going to bash them from the outside. Let's open this up. John, I want to hear from John, who's sure. been listening here. He's been thinking a lot about what do we need to do to big tech, particularly around data. But I'm just curious. Hearing what you're just hearing there, anything to add, anything to push back on, anything to, uh, to uh, I'm, just, I'm just outing you, man. It's like wow. you start this conversation a little bit. And could you just stand up and introduce oh yourself? Oh, my goodness. And, um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm John. I, I'm known for sitting in that chair a year ago. Yeah. I think that's pretty, pretty much it. Exactly. Hi, Stephen. Um, I wrote a book about Google a long time ago. Uh, and actually, there was 12 or 13 chapters and only one of them on the downside. And I really had to think very hard about what it might be because we were so caught up in how much up there was left to go. This was 2004. So um, I've changed my mind. I, I, gener I enjoy listening to, to Scott. I have for many years enjoyed listening to him. Um, so I don't have a lot to disagree with. And I hope more people do listen to him. There's not as much courage as he displays because I guess you know tenure does that. Do you have tenure? No, I'm an at-will employee. I can be fired at any moment. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, tenure is nothing but debt on young people. I'm totally against it. Sorry, go ahead, John. So he's even ranting against NYU. Excellent. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, the one thing that I generally disagree with, uh, although I don't disagree with the theory of the case uh, about antitrust, I don't think antitrust is going to happen. Yep. And I think the, 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 the amount of work required and the case that needs to be brought and the yeah. judge that needs to be found to agree with that case, it is, uh, on average, antitrust is about an eight to yeah. 11 year process. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think we have eight to 11 years. Yeah. So what I'd prefer to see is legislation that requires machine readable data portability between platforms and allows entrepreneurs to create an ecosystem around that machine readable data portability so that people can share their data even when they don't understand how valuable it is because their agents and entrepreneurs will realize that value and create companies and venture capitalists will back those companies because all of a sudden the monopoly on that information is broken. So that's the kind of antitrust I would prefer yep. but it would have to be an elegant piece of legislation as opposed to uh, antitrust, which is in, in fact not legislation, it is a government action in court. Yep. Um, so that's just, that's the one thing that I think could truly break these companies up because it would force them to compete not on their control of your information ecosystem, but rather on providing services based on the same data layer. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, imagine if all of a sudden you could go to another place and bring your entire search history, we would see new search engines, right? We, yep. we just would. Um, so that's, mm. that's, the one thing I'll add. Just, um, yep. John's also started a new company called uh, The Recount, which is covering kind of politics and a lot of yeah. tech over that. How likely do you think that is to get through in the next, uh, you know, coming out of this election? I, it's about as likely as antitrust action is, is my guess. Uh, oh, really? Although the Access Act, which you talked about, yeah. is, is a step in that direction. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, I think first we have to see a new administration. Yeah. Um, and second, we have to see a couple of years of that new administration bumbling around and doing what at least Democratic administrations do, which is you know form blue ribbon committees and study right. the issue. Right. Um, but Obama did a lot of that work actually um, until it sort of just stopped entirely for the yeah. past three years. Um, but I think it could happen. Um, it, it would just require a more enlightened set of uh, regulators driven by a more enlightened administration and Congress. Interesting. Um, can we out you to give any reaction to, to what you, I'd love to hear from Stephen. Uh, Stephen, again, long time covering the tech industry up and down, knows everybody in the valley, and just spent years working on yeah. this book for, for Facebook, spending a lot of time with Zuck. I don't know. You can't really talk about your book. It's coming out in well, late I could, February. I could tell you it's coming out. I could tell you that you can pre order on Amazon right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Facebook, the inside story. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till I stop talking before you plug it into your browsers and buy it. But please do. Um, but what, what do you, what do you yeah, make of this? So, well, Any look, thoughts? you know, I, I also did a book about Google. I did it a few years after John. So I was able to think of a few more bad things to right. say than, than, than John did. Um, and, you know, uh, Facebook was a, a different process um, of, uh, for me. Uh, and I think it's, it's the story of Facebook. You know, I mean, uh, it's got, you know, it, incredibly amusing and brilliant, brilliant insights here. But um, the, beyond the polemic, there's an amazing story there. And the story comes on top of the strata, Scott referred to it, is a strata of politics, a strata of the financial system. I think if Mark Zuckerberg were never born, there would be some other company, maybe not doing it the same way, but there would be something dominating the social network space. You know, uh, you, you're nodding your head, you, you agree with that. It just happened in a certain way because a unique character named Mark Zuckerberg um, you know, met a bunch of other unique characters and Cheryl and, um, and, and things unfolded in a way where you got this unique story of this company now, which, you know, you talk about how likable and everyone likes them. Not everyone likes Mark Zuckerberg. I, uh, if you watched any of the testimony of, of just a few weeks ago in Washington, uh, there's a lot of people who really don't like him, but I don't think they're going to do much about it. Yeah. yeah so, um, so you don't see the, any kind of DOJ attack. You don't see them kind of carving off any Well, of we have a financial system. Scott you know, painted a pretty good picture about a company like WeWork and Uber and how they managed to abuse the system and you know, screw in their investors and certainly their, their employees, and that happened. And then you've got Washington, and what's happening there is we're all getting screwed. Um, and you know, I'd be, my question for Scott is, you know, who would you rather have as president, Mark Zuckerberg or Donald Trump? Or Elizabeth well, Warren. 
One's a dumb sociopath, one's a very smart sociopath. So I'll take the smart sociopath. So <laughs> there you go. go. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I, the policy, and I'd be curious to get John's talking Mark about Mark is old enough next election, by the way. Well, I think... I think <laughs> Before I think, this all came up, he was doing his kind of tours. He was it? not running for president. He was I think not, Cheryl okay. was, though. Yeah, that's, that's another story. I think Cheryl, yeah. Cheryl was planning on running for president. And I think a lot of this has gotten in um, her way. But yeah, politics, I, I watched the recount, which is John's startup, to get kind of caught up on stuff. But um, if you look at, and now we're talking about politics, but you asked for a prediction. I love politics, and I'm, I, you, I'm pretty good on predictions in business. I'm terrible with politics. But if Elizabeth Warren is our nominee, Trump takes 38 states. Uh, uh, we will elect a sociopath wrapped in a good economy over a soft socialist. We'll take soft fascism off her over soft socialism and a good economy every day of the week. But you, you, that's not what you asked for. I don't think the Zuck's running for president. No, he's, he's not. I don't think he, he was. Yeah, I think that. Cheryl was, and the polls have come back pretty bad. Well, we've had the conversations about that. Something else you'll see. Yep. Well, let's pick uh, up on that. But it. let's open it up to folks. A uh, lot of stimulating questions here. Um, and uh, uh, let's see here. What, what's right here? Let's try this. And then let me see the hands of people who want to just do it. OK. Please introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, stand up and introduce yourself. Because uh, we're Tristan videoing Lewis this. And, from yeah. TNL.net and long time cover. I mean, I've been covering the space for a long time. Um, so you say if they broke, let's assume that yep. antitrust is possible and, that, yep. and you can break up those companies. And yep. now they start getting into each other's business. Yep. So Google is a search company. And let's say Microsoft decides to go after Google's business and launches a search engine. We'll call it Bing just for yep. the, the case of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, And let's say Amazon is now the standalone uh, e-commerce company and Walmart, the largest uh, company in uh, uh, in retail, it's trying to go into this business also and launches Walmart.com. Yep. Haven't we seen that story before and has it not really played out to anything else than monopolies? You mean eventually they come back together and they become monopolies yep. again. So that's a fair point. And if you look at the breakup of AT&T, mm -hmm. they all, we ended up, we went from one to nine, now we're back to basically two and a half again. So you're right, it, we probably will end up in the same space, but what I would argue is between now and then, there's tremendous innovation and in, in value that's unlocked. That we might end up back in a similar situation where one search company controls 90% of the market, but between here and there, if we have several search engines, I think more VC-backed companies, I think more taxes paid, I think more hiring, I think... But you have several search engines. Well, that depends if you call Amazon a search engine. Okay, you can call Amazon a search engine right. or commerce. Yep. You can call Bing from Microsoft a search engine. Yep. Come on. He's just, because he's not on the mic here. He's okay. just, yeah. okay. That are search engines. Yep. And it seems the customers yep. have voted. So, uh, if we were to, for example, if you look at, so we like to think we're in this era of innovation. And if you watch CNBC or read the Wall Street Journal, you would think we live in this era, of, this unbelievable era of innovation. There were twice as many companies being started every day and the Carter administration than there are now. The 15% uh, of companies used to be less than a year old, now it's 7%. This is the era of non-innovation. There are a ton of people here that should be starting businesses, but the problem is the fastest growing parts of our economy are controlled by monopolies or duopolies. So the, if you look at sectors in terms of seed funding, the companies where seed funding has dropped off a cliff the last five years, tech hardware, Search. Try and get a social company start funded right now. E-commerce. They're all, they've all fallen off a cliff. The places where all the seed funding is going into is where there's no one dominant company. Fintech. There's seven big players in the U.S. And what do you know? Fintech is exploding. Biotech. I mean, uh, where there's no monopoly. And so I believe, and I think we might end up back in the same place, but I think if we broke these guys up, we would oxygenate the uh, economy with a ton more seed startups, a ton more employment, a ton more hiring, and a ton more competition. We might end up back in the same place, just as we have with telco, but the last 40 years have been disco in the markets for telco. There's been unbelievable value created that I would argue may not have been created had AT&T been the one kind right. of lumbering giant. And there's also a natural monopoly argument that maybe we should have one search engine that the requisite investments and having everyone, everyone on one search platform makes sense. 
But then that's called the utility. Florida Power and Light, there should just be one utility with one coal fire plant or whatever it is with one line. I get it. And we have regulators who live at FPL saying this is how much you can charge and you have to be transparent about your practices. So my feeling is when you get to this monopoly era, you're either a monopoly and you should be broken up or you should be regulated around your pricing and more transparency around what you're doing with people's data. Your argument's a valuable one, though, and it's a valid one, and a lot of people say, what's the point? We're going to end up back in the same place anyways. But the regulations, we didn't talk about that, but the utility analogy, if there was only one place to do a lot of these key things, not just search, but you could imagine, you know, Amazon e-commerce or, you know, whatever it is, Apple apps or whatever it is, um, regulation, I mean, more transparency, more kind of oversight, you think that's a viable way potentially forward as well? Yeah, and what John was talking about, and John's friend, and I don't know him as well, but I have a ton of respect for him. He's like, you know, as kind of inflammatory and, 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 and crazy as I am. The guy with the substance is an academic up at uh, Columbia named Tim Wu, who teaches oh, yeah. at the law school. And he makes very thoughtful arguments around regulation and interoperability. And I understand the breakup part of it, and I think I can speak to it with some credibility. He understands the regulation part. That's where it gets above my pay grade. But I think it's a combination of all of those things. What's not going to happen is a consumer-led revolution. That's what always cracks me up, that we're going to expect us to do something about it. If you ordered a little black dress today from H&M, how can that happen without, without human rights abuses? Like, how can, that, how can that happen? And yet, at the end of the day, consumers will use kind of CSR or whatever it is as a tiebreaker that they, generally speaking, go for the best product at the lowest price, full stop. Hmm. In the back here, could you introduce yourself? And yeah. It should, it should be on unless you touched it, yeah. Okay, uh, so hi, my name is... Do we have it on? This is like... The mic? I know it's two, the one's because of the live stream, we got folks coming from all over. Okay, there we go. There we go. Hi, my name is Courtney Harding. Um, your comment about human rights abuses actually led quite well into the question I was gonna ask. Yep. Um, I was first gonna ask you to just, um, murder magically because I imagine that would be pretty funny to watch you do and I would like to see that. The but, Florida unicorn? One of two Florida unicorns. But my larger question is Magic Leap is, is really funded by, at least in a large part, the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, yep. as is Uber, as are a lot of other companies. Twitter. Twitter. And given everything that we know about yeah. what has happened, including uh, human rights violations, journalist murders, why aren't why does no one care? Why are people like, yeah, that's a bummer. We made a mistake, but like they still use Uber, they still use Twitter. Yep. No one's buying Magic Leap, so I guess that's kind of a different thing. But companies yep. are still willing to take money from yep. them. And when Magic Leap announced their raise from the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, literally no one I saw was like, oh, that's a bad thing. People were like, cool, more money for Magic Leap right. and their right. vapor right. headsets. So, I mean, murder Magic Leap if you'd like, because I would enjoy watching you do it, because I think you're good at murdering <laughs> these companies. Um, but the larger question is really more serious, is why yeah. does no one care that the Saudi Sovereign Wealth yep. Fund is pouring money into American startups? Yep. So it's, we, it's, it's strange and wonderful that you brought up magically. I'm a resident of Florida, and I've lived there for nine years, and I commute to New York two days a week uh, to teach and to, to do some work. And we have two unicorns. I think we're the third or the fourth largest state by economy, and we only have two. Chewy which is kind of a cooler pets.com that actually works, <laughs> and Magic Leap. And as far as I can tell, Magic Leap is just not working. VR, and it's not just Magic Leap. VR is stupid. We anoint people Jesus Christ of our generation. You know who it caused Magic Leap? It was Mark Zuckerberg who said VR was going to unlock new worlds. Anyone using their virtual reality? Supposedly, Mike, do you do use it? I do it for a living, but I don't like Oh, you don't like Magic Leap. But, okay, so effectively, Internet of Things, 3D printing, virtual reality... Um, all these things are ridiculous. Y your, your blender doesn't need to speak to the internet. People still are paying 7,000 bucks to show up to my class. Supposedly VR was going to just ruin my career. People are not doing surgery. I mean, some stuff, but there'll be limited applications, but magically looks to be just something that one of these incinerators, access to cheap capital, charismatic founder, and it's going away. Your broader question around why we continue to take money. Now, as I get older, I'm a conspiracy theorist. Wow. And just, That's because, a growing just trend. because I'm paranoid doesn't mean I'm wrong, right? Okay, so this is what really happened at WeWork. The CIA has enlisted Masayoshi San as an agent and an asset and has said, we need to wreak havoc in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia 
They're an unethical government, and we want to create dissent and agita and murder and instability in the kingdom. And at the same time, we want to transfer back five years equivalent of oil import revenue. So we're going to basically create this luxury item, and all wealthy people feel they're entitled to luxury items, and this luxury item is going to be called the Vision One Fund. And you're going to do it because you had the luckiest investment in the world. You put $20 million into Alibaba, and it's worth $100 billion. And so we think we, you can fool them into giving you 40 to $60 billion. And what we're going to do is we're going to transfer all of that wealth very unevenly, but we're going to transfer all of it to America, and we're going to get back five years of oil wealth. It could happen. <laughs> now, I realize how crazy. That's season eight of Homeland. Um, Homeland. I am torn about whether or not we should cash their checks. Because, for example, the Japanese in the 80s started buying our golf courses and our studios, and everyone was in a kind of a racist rant saying, well, they're trying to do it to us economically what they couldn't do it to us militarily. And we were freaked out. And you know what happened? They left with pennies on the dollar, and a bunch of American investors and owners of studios and golf courses made like bandits, and they left. I'm not sure whether we shouldn't be cashing their check. I know how terrible that is, but if they want to bring down the cost of capital for American entrepreneurs by flooding the market with cheap capital, fine. Don't put them on your board, kick them off your board, but I'm torn. I, I have no moral clarity around whether or not American startups shouldn't take the cheapest source of capital. I understand the moral conflict around it. I, I understand when people say we shouldn't take their money, but I think there's an argument to say, if American companies can cash someone's check and transfer money, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is going to get hurt by Uber. A, 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 an illegitimate or what I'd call you know, not a wonderful government is about to get a serious shit kicking at the hands of Uber and we. Is that a bad thing? Should we have not cashed their check? I don't know. So I don't, I don't have a great answer. I think there's good arguments on both sides. But if I were an entrepreneur raising money, I'm not sure I wouldn't cash their check. I think it's easy to say don't take their money. Anybody back here? Let's go way back. I know there's others over here, but let's, we haven't had anyone from this side, so let's get you, let's get the mic there. Uh, hi, Scott. Uh, my name is Sid. I um, work here with Fahrenheit. Thank you for that. That's uh, fantastic insights and really helpful to Thank kind of you. frame that in the broader scale of things that are happening. I have a question for you. So as you've thought about and looked at the market collapsing 10 years ago, You've seen it in 99. Um, with all the things you know now, what's the next business I should be building next year? <laughs> if I were a young guy with your hair, I'd be running for senator of Pennsylvania. But <laughs> <laughs> seriously, my rap, your hair. We're overseeing the intelligence committee in like two election cycles. Um, anyways. The business I would be on, if I was coming out of business school, I mean, there's a You must get this all the time with you. You got yeah. all these business school kids. So kids come to my office hours and never want to talk about brand strategy or digital marketing, which is what I want to teach. They want to talk about their careers. If you charge someone 170 grand for a credential, that's like, okay, boss, I need to make serious money. And they all want to talk about their careers. <laughs> um, and a third thinks about this. A third of my class goes to work for Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google. And they all think I'm going to try and talk them out of it. I'm like, oh, no, go to work there. Fantastic employers, great second degree, great, great credentials. Bad for the planet, but you should take a job there. Um, <laughs> I would want to do a couple things. One, I would want to uh, get to a city. You've done that. I would want to get as close to processing power as possible. I think the next trillionaire or the next multi-hundred billion dollar um, uh, opportunities are going to be around how technology disrupts healthcare. But the twist is not to save money, but to save time. I think that, the, unfortunately, because of our Hunger Games economy, all the wealth is accreting to the top 10%. And all they want from healthcare, they don't want lower costs. Everybody in this room is probably insured pretty well. What we want is, I got, I got, I'll use a personal anecdote. I had a cough I couldn't get rid of, and so my family just freaked out. You need to go get an X-ray before you. I was going uh, away on a long trip. I'm like, you got to get a chest X-ray. I had to go to the doctor, get a prescription. I had to go to Diagnostic Center of America, who turned me away because the prescription wasn't signed. I had to go back. It was eight hours to get what was effectively an 11-minute X-ray. Amazon show, prime health, AI, that'll take 30 minutes. 20 minutes, 7 minutes. And whoever figures out a way to become HIPAA compliant and figure out a way not even to save money in healthcare, but to take a time machine, what's the point of spending three or four years of your life managing healthcare to live another six months? We should just cut a big deal. I'm never going to see a doctor and I'll die a little bit early, right? 
there's a decent trade-off there. Anyway, I'm not suggesting anybody do that. <laughs> I think the place it's going to get the place it's going to get a ton of funding and create a ton of value is around the most disruptable business in the world, healthcare. The second most disruptable business in the yeah. world, what is it? Oh, after healthcare. After healthcare, someone said it. Education? My business. I get paid. Okay. Kids pay seven thousand dollars to take my class. That's me in front of these slides for two hours and 40 minutes for 12 nights. That's $100,000 a night. I remind myself that every time I walk in. My agent takes 98% commission, NYU. <laughs> That's not sustainable. There's got to be a ton of opportunities in education to give people skills, credentialing opportunities for more economic upside without charging them $170,000 and creating an application process that says, you're either some kid from the inner city that's already got a patent, oh yeah, that's easy, or you're the son of rich parents. That's what basically, I work for the biggest caste system in the world, right? The reason, literally the reason I'm here is because of the generosity and vision of California taxpayers and the regents of UC. I was raised by a single mother. I got undergrad and grad at UCLA and Berkeley for $7,000. That's why I'm here. I have absolutely no illusions that it was my talent or my good looks. It's, it's, it's state-sponsored education. Now, school is 160 grand for two years at Stern. And, and we basically said, okay, who gets into school? Rich kids. We've decided that the spoils of our economy and the innovators have one thing in common. They're going to be the children of rich people. And the man in the mirror is the guy responsible for it because we become drunk on luxury. Professors used to be public servants. Now we're luxury brands. And every year my dean gets up and every dean of every business school gets up and brags and he says the following or she says the following. We had 10,000 applications and we only admitted 700 people. We had a 93% decline rate or a 7% admissions rate. Stanford has tripled the number of applications in the last 30 years. They haven't increased their freshman seats one seat. So they could say nobody gets in. How many people my age brag that they could never get in? And they brag like it's a good thing. Well, that means your kid isn't getting in. Your kid isn't going to Stanford. She's going to Pepperdine. Well done. If we don't start figuring out a way to make education, again, a public service like they do in Europe, instead of this caste system hunger games like lottery economy, we're literally, we have thrown sand in the gears of the greatest system of upward mobility in the history, and that's American universities. It is, it is terrible what I am a part of. The costs are out of control. We should absolutely put me out of work. <laughs> awesome. Someone I'm with you. That, um, yeah. okay. Get rid of them. Okay, so let's get go rid of them. deep. We haven't gotten to one deep here, and then we'll get to you in the front here. But anyhow, yes. Uh, we're, getting, we're winding down here, but this has been a great conversation. Keep going. Hi, uh, David Berkowitz. I've uh, got a consultancy serial marketer, so uh, Hi, loving David. this. And, uh, uh, and so, so I want to ask something about the ad industry. Yep. Uh, uh, is there basically the equivalent of what you're talking about, like with Airbnb, one of yep. the few positive examples, that's an ad-supported business, something yep. that's like fiscally sound that you think is also yep. doing good? There. Doing well. So one of the things I advise my kids on is any ad-supported ecosystem, the advertising industrial complex, run from. The primary means of shareholder value or the algorithm to create a ton of value from the end of World War II to the introduction of Google was the following. Take a shitty product, a marginal product, a marginal car de manufactured in Detroit, a marginal sugary drink, a marginal beer, and wrap these amazing brand codes around it. American, masculine, European elegance, maternal feelings, paternal security, and then sell this shitty product for incredible margins using this incredibly efficient and inexpensive medium called broadcast television. You could reach tens of millions of people. The Oscars used to cost $60,000 when 30 million people were watching it. Now it costs half a million when 11 million are watching it. The advertising industrial complex is literally coming to an end. How do you know you're rich? You're not subject to this shitty thing called advertising. Modern Family, which is an amazing show, monetizes every viewer 49 cents for nine minutes of ads. So they've said your time is worth $3.40 an hour. And Apple said, no, it's not. People will pay 20 bucks an hour. They'll pay us three bucks to avoid it. So how many of you download 
shows on iTunes or Apple at three bucks when you could get it for free, but you don't have to endure that, that nine minutes of bullshit called advertising. Advertising has become a tax that the poor and the technologically illiterate pay. You want to run as far from that ecosystem <laughs> as possible. It's becoming the personal injury, the, the low budget hotel. It, the, look at the ads. Basically, advertising is the pharmaceutical Full Employment Act. Oh, you have opioid-induced constipation. I mean, it is just, <laughs> I watch ads now, I'm like, oh, advertising is basically a nine-minute lesson in how much it sucks to get old, and that you should buy a South Korean car or a shitty light beer. Boom, I just saved you. Do you realize if you only let your kids watch Netflix, if you only let your kids watch Netflix this year, they save three weeks in advertising. Netflix is the best bargain out there. It's a time machine. If I watch Netflix for the rest of my life, I save 11 months in advertising for 5,500 bucks. I'll extend my life a year for 5,500 bucks. Anything that's ad supported, run my brother, run. <laughs> okay, well to add on that though, for those of us who value good journalism, yeah, yeah. Uh, does the inverse, is the inverse true that in fact, People are going to pay for good journalism, and we are going to build a good journalistic ecosystem that's sound and adequate to the challenges ahead of us, or, or any thoughts on that? So I'm boasting. I was on the board of the New York Times for two years, and the first thing, and this is a true story, I suggested in my first board meeting was we got to shut up Google. They're taking our data, they're commoditizing us, they're giving us a nickel, and they're selling it for a dollar, and we're taking the Birkin bag of this gorgeous content, and we're selling it through Walmart. And it's a sewer, and I wanted to get together the, the Murdochs, the new houses, the guys from the FT, and say, we got to shut this shit off. And, but no, we got caught up in the idolatry of innovator. No, we want to be cool. And Steve Jobs came and met with us, so we put our app on there, and then we met the smart people at Google and said, okay, pull up your dump truck and take all our money. I mean, we could not have been more stupid. Now, what's happened in the last four years is that truth has become differentiated. Like, fact-driven, peer review truth has all of a sudden become differentiated because the amount of lies has grown so exponentially that all of a sudden the Washington Post and the New York Times are luxury brands and people, good journalists like yourself, Peter, who actually fact check and push back and show on both sides, these great credible brands, including the Wall Street Journal, including some conservative outlets, are all of a sudden people value them more because they're highly differentiated, not because they've gotten so much better, be because the world has gotten so much worse of everything surrounding them. So the Washington Post, the New York Times, for the first time, their subscription revenue is now greater than their ad revenue, which again is a really good forward-looking indicator. So I have, a lot of, I have a lot of hope for the first time in a long time around, uh, around journalism. I, it, now, the scary part is the number of corporate PR executives has tripled in the last 30 years. Tripled. Corporate PR executives have tripled in the last 30 years, and the number of journalists have been halved, which means the ratio of bullshit spin to truth has, gone, has been flipped six to one. And I take a vow, and I ask any other person in any sort of influence, I'm self-absorbed enough to think I'm an influencer, I refuse to meet with any corporate PR person. And they mask, hey, Scott, we should have lunch. Or, hey, Scott, how about lunch with me and our CEO? I'm like, you're in, you're in PR, you're in communications. They call themselves different things communications, strategists, and I'm like, don't meet with any of them. And always, always, I will meet or return the call of any journalist. I will never meet with a corporate communications hack. They are literally have overwhelmed the system. And the greatest police force, the greatest investigative force in the history of mankind that doesn't carry badges and guns are U.S. journalists. And so for the first time, I think we finally bottomed out, and I think for the first time, we see a year-on-year -year increase in the number of journalists. And I think it's a I think it's a wonderful thing because billionaire Republicans buy football teams, billionaire Democrats buy newspapers, which is probably a good thing. Is that a good thing? Do you think that's a good thing? There's, it's there's, better than going under, I suppose, but yeah. is that a good thing? I, I do think on the whole, it's not ideal, but on the whole, a benign owner with really deep pockets is probably a pretty good owner for a media company. Who, and by the way, so far the owners, everyone thought Rupert Murdoch was going to ruin the Wall Street Journal. Maybe you hate Rupert Murdoch. The Wall Street Journal, I think, does, still does a great job. And by the way, the Wall Street Journal right now is considered the most trusted brand in the middle. That's where the middle is now. I think that Bezos, I'm not a fan of Bezos, as you can tell. 
I think he's done a great job with the Post. I think the Post is a more robust entity now with his resources. And my sense is he's kept his hands up mostly. Do you, you know this better than I do. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm hearing good things. So, about so this. far, I think about it's, others might know is better. it ideal? I'd rather it be owned by all of us or, but so far, I think it's been, it's been a, a, net, a net positive. Okay, we're coming to the very end here of this uh, time together, live stream, the video, all the thing. And you showed a glimmer of hope there. You, you were optimistic there about, about the rise of, uh, of uh, journalism. But I, I want to just give a last word here of just, are you generally optimistic about what lies ahead here for America in the next... Because I'm writing this piece to 2050, right? Yeah. And it's an unabashedly positive but plausible scenario because we're fighting so many dystopian narratives yep. actually out there. Uh, whether it's sci-fi or whether it's news stories or whether it's, you know, the robots are going to take over or climate change is going to kill us all or everything's bad and, oh, my God, we're killing each other. It's civil war in the country. I mean, whatever. We know all that negative stuff. But what was interesting, when I reached out to you for this story, you immediately jumped to it and you said, you know what, we got to be thinking more positively about right. what's ahead. Right. So tell me why you were interested in that and tell me how you actually feel. What do you tell your kids? What do you, what do you actually think is going to happen here coming up? Look, there's some wonderful, I mean, my steady state is angry and depressed. That's kind of what I, <laughs> that's my heart rate. That's my heart rate at rest. But if you zoom back and you look at the world, infant mortality has been cut in half in, in 30 years it was supposed to take 50. True, true abject poverty goes down at a faster rate than the World Health Organization was projecting. We're probably going to get rid of hepatitis C. Is now, I mean, there's some wonderful, wonderful things when you zoom back. When you look at America, I'm less hopeful. But what always encourages me, I always think about my mom. My mom in 1944 was a four-year-old Jew living in London. And her dad used to have to take her and her four sisters into a bomb shelter that was the makeshift tube. The London Underground is where they slept because their, their house had been bombed. And if Hitler had, got, had gotten across the channel, I wouldn't be here. And think about, like, think about how technology turned that back. It was technology. We were in a foot race to split the atom uh, before Hitler. And a bunch, like, essentially 40,000 super smart Canadians, uh, Americans, and British got there faster. And then 30 years later, we put a man on the moon with 400,000 Americans, Canadians, British, and some very smart Nazi rocket engineers. <laughs> But my God, if we can turn back Hitler, if my mom was sleeping in a bomb shelter, we can absolutely turn back fucking Google. <laughs> I mean, for God's sakes, we can, you know, if there's a greater comity of man, if there's a rallying cry, if there's the kind of leadership that can continually is demonstrated in America, we can absolutely address these changes. I'm very, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm angry and depressed, but when I pull back, I'm incredibly optimistic about what we can, what we can accomplish here. Right on, brothers and sisters. <laughs> right on. And that's a great place to end. Let's give a great hand for Scott. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. There's more food, more drink to mill around here. But really, thanks so much. A great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.